Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the kind uh, invitation. And uh, just among us, I like very much Dublin. And it is a terrible thing that I can just spend 18 hours in Dublin because I arrived yesterday and sh I shall go back. So um, I gave to the title to this short presentation from crisis to recovery, and I think we should go back to the roots uh, when we would like to talk also about how can we solve this, this uh, problem. So let's start with Jonathan Swiss, you know, maybe this famous political uh, commentator, author, and satirist who was born in Dublin, uh, and he offers in his book and pamphlets and inside food and often biting critic on the times which he lived and on the human nature more broadly. But his words, however, continue, I think, to resonate today. In Gulliver's travel, uh, undoubtedly his most popular work, Gulliver is a sleeping giant. Shipwrecked, washed ashore, tied up, and unable to move seeming powerful, but in reality asleep and trapped. Almost 300 years at the dawn of this new century, there's a new sleeping giant, I would say, Europe. Uh, Samuel Rowley, director of the London Stock Exchange Group, uh, put it very eloquently. Uh, I quote it, Europe has been asleep and the debt has been the sleeping pill, or formulated in a less eloquent way. Credit was too easy and people became lazy. So people believed that all problems could be solved with a credit card. They didn't have to wait or plain or save or anything they might want. And more than that, they could make themselves rich or uh, at least feel rich. They could make themselves rich and feel rich by going into debt. Uh, it was a very compelling illusion, I think. And many governments responded similarly and uh, also went on a spending spree. Times were good, and many of the brightest minds in the uh, public life believed that the good times were going to last. Year on year, too many government budgets were in deficit, leading to ever-increasing public debt. Irrational exuberance, maybe you know the word, was the term coined by Lenin Greenspan, the influential chairman of the Federal Reserve at the time. So taking together irrational exuberance, the easy credit, and the growing debt means that incentive to take risks, to be creative, and to be innovative were lost. And there was, was in, in innovation and creativity, for example, in, in developing even more complex financial products. It was largely unsustainable and at times even destructive. The giant was sleeping soundly. So as a result, I think, a decade was lost. Governments were distracted and failed to spot the reforms that were needed. Instead, they spent their time accruing uh, more debt. Uh, these countries were the most vulnerable when the credit crunch hit. In fact, the countries which appeared not to be doing uh, so well during these boom times, such as Germany, were the ones which carried out significant reforms uh, on their welfare system, labor market regulation, and their fiscal policies. And those countries have fared much better during the financial crisis. Earlier this year, Martin Wolf of the Financial Times commented that economic collapse was large and the rescue has been dramatic. Since the iconic collapse of Lehman Brothers in uh, 2008, Europe has acted with uh, self-confidence and determination. But I think we need to get beyond the rescue. Fiscal stability is the prerequisite for a healthy economy, but for a growing and successful economy, more is needed. Uh, in today's speech, I want to talk in more detail about these policy themes beyond rescue, and I will turn um, offer some reflections on the crisis and the forms it has taken in Europe, put forward some principles for recovery, consider what actions the EU is taking, touch on the Hungarian situation and the progress uh, being made, and finish with some conclusion thoughts and, I think, questions. So much has already been said about the crisis, what has happened and why, and there is no need to revisit these analyses and analysis and debates here. Nevertheless, there are three points uh, that are important from the perspective of the competitiveness of Europe. Using the term of Neil Ferguson, the influential Harvard historian, the model of so-called debt-propelled consumerism has been the main problem and has dealt the most punishing blows. It has not been the service sector which were worst hit by the crisis, but rather those services fueled by low inflation and cheap uh, credit. 
So it may be stating that obvious, but uh, recovery will not be sustainable if the over-reliance on cheap credit and mounting deficit and debt to boost economic growth continues. Second, I think there is no silver bullet for managing the crisis in Europe. Each country has different economic problems. I know that uh, these statements is, is, uh, is not, a, not a unknown, but in Ireland, the real estate uh, boom financed by a tremendous inflow of cheap credit was a problem. In Portugal, year on year, slow and almost under recognizable growth, increase the over-dependence on tourist industry and the lack of solid and export-oriented industrial base. And each country has different strengths and drivers that will help restore economic growth. Hence, uh, we need to discern carefully what policies and actions are required at the EU level and what at the member state level. So, and the third point, more than a half a century ago, Friedrich August von Hayek highlighted that decentralized systems are more resilient, more able to learn, more adaptable, more flexible, more responsible, uh, responsive to the changes, and more creative and more innovative. In centralized systems, the cost of wrong decisions are much higher, and when times get tough, centralized systems are less flexible and more likely to crash. We are all aware of the fact that capitalism is by definition a decentralized system of trial and error, and that is why it is so successful. Now we have to apply this common thought to the crisis and to the search for the path to recovery. So these three reflections, that proper consumerism, no silver bullet, and uh, decentralized systems, inform the present approach to competition and competitiveness in Europe. An important implication is that competition in the European context mean both the competitiveness of the EU and the single market as a whole, and the healthy and productive competition between the different models and markets within Europe. Consequently, I think, the huge challenge is to strike the right balance between enhancing competitiveness on the European scale, at the same time as maintaining the required competition among different model countries and so on. So turning now to recovery, having some clear principle and to guide us is important. And uh, there are four principles which I believe are central to ensuring a healthy recovery. First, along with efforts to ensure fiscal stability and crisis management, we shouldn't forget to strengthen our efforts to increase competitiveness. It is no widespread thought that without increasing competitiveness of Europe's economy and without higher growth, we cannot solve the fiscal imbalances and debt in the long run. <clears throat> Second, it may it seem maybe blatantly obvious, I think, but industry increasingly matters. In simple terms, we need to make products that are tangible in the true sense of word, products that people want to buy and at home and abroad. So, but sometimes what is simple is too easily forgotten. And while the knowledge economy and information society are still alive and with us, so is in industry. Third, it is the marginal uh, differences that distinguish between success, mediocrity, and failure. Sport people may be more than any other recognize these as train uh, themselves to shave milliseconds from their race at times. So above all, innovation has become a decisive driving force for growth. And as Steve Jobs highlights the maximum of all times, innovation distinguishes between leaders and followers. And if Europe wants to be a leader, it must focus more on innovation. And fourth, we must not give up the normative requirement that recovery and growth should be sustainable and should result in job creation. The last decade in the US was characterized by the jobless growth, that is growth, growing economic output with relative minor positive effect on employment increases, and it can hence be joined as joyless growth. So in Europe, <clears throat> we now are facing the challenge that the recovery should be jobful and joyful recovery. Now, moving to the more practical, what is actually happening within the EU and what is being done that takes us beyond rescue. In Europe, there have been three main reform agendas with different priorities, different constitutions, and at very different stages of elaboration. These are the Getting Europe Growing Agenda, the Europe Plus Pact, and a Single Market Act. 
So the question is, are these rival agendas, does this fragment the EU or does it target specific needs? The Getting Europe Growing agenda was signed in March uh, 2011 by nine prime ministers, mainly from among the northern European countries, and is based on unleashing entrepreneurial capacities by cutting red tape, deepening the single market, and boosting and investing in research, development, and innovation. What is distinctively novel in this agenda is the message of innovation, and certainly this is a powerful concept which has long been at the heart of the success of the US economy. Nevertheless, there are growing gaps to bridge, such as the gap between the EU and the US and Japan with regard to R&D spending relative to GDP, the gap between the aspiration of Europeans to increase this spending to 3% of the GDP, and the delivery, which is currently stand at 1.9%, and the gap between member states regarding their innovative capacities and their R&D performances. The Getting Europe Growing agenda gives a focal point for more strategic and in-depth thinking and policy development on innovation. In notable contrast, the Euro Plus Pact places the emphasis on economic governance, stronger cooperation in the field of budget and debt control. In fact, Hungary, along with UK, Sweden and Czech Republic, has not signed the Euro Plus Pact. However, now speaking to the Hungarian situation, we are fully in line with all but one point. Let's have a look at the main aspects of the pact. Institutionalizing a debt break is crucial, and a new Hungarian constitution adopted last month contains a particular chapter on public financing and regulates that debt should not exceed 50% of the GDP. The second point of the pact stresses the importance of introdu introducing flexicurity in the labor market, lowering taxes on labor, creating an effective gap between living for job and living on benefit. These measures are now at the backbone of the reforms in Hungary, as is stated in the so-called Sale Common Plan, launched in uh, March this year, and will be put in practice until the end of 20. Uh, 12. The third point of the pact requires aligning the pension system to the national demographic situation, such as aligning the effective retirement age with life expectancy or limiting early retirement age, and the Hungarian government has already started to deal with these issues in the framework of the uh, already mentioned Sale Common Plan. Now, the four points concerning uh, reviewing the wage setting arrangements in order to couple wages wage increases with productivity improvements is a practice since the new government took office in June last year. Hence, there is only one point where Hungary is restricted, and this is the common consolidated corporate tax base. On the one hand, CCCTB will result in a real loss in GDP in Hungary, and as Michael Devereaux from Oriel College, Oxford, calculated, the loss would be a month at up to 0.9% of GDP. In a time of slow recovery, we simply cannot afford a loss of GDP at this scale. And on the other hand, this is against our definite aim to create the most favorable pro-business environment and to be the most competitive country in Central and Eastern Europe. So the turned reform agenda is the most far-reaching, the most substantive, and in the Competitiveness Council that I am chairing during the Hungarian presidency, the most important, the Single Market Act. It is one of the consequences of the crisis that the single market has climbed back up uh, the European political agenda again. Although the aftermath of the financial crisis, many, both within and outside of Europe, are questioning the added value of the single market, as profoundly laid out in the 2010 report by Professor Mario Monti, the single market is going through some very testing time. Nevertheless, uh, we believe that the single market is Europe's biggest competitive advantage. And it is clear to us that uh, now the time has come for more for a major political impetus towards the single market. Jacques Delors was right when he sarcastically stated, nobody can fall in love with a single market. It is, however, equally true that if we want to leave the financial crisis behind and enter a period of growth, it is the single market which provides the basis for productivity increases, both in terms of labor and resources. So the Hungarian presidency therefore welcomes the recommitment and the renewal of the single market. 
The relaunch the Single Market Act is critical to what's happening at the moment and provides us with the opportunity to tackle what I consider to be the four main challenges facing the single market. These are avoiding fragmentation, addressing the so-called troubleshooting approach, boosting innovation, and being aware of the fact that single market is an evergreen issue. Today, to some extent, not only the single market, but the single market policy itself is deeply fragmented. Just look at it. It has been chopped up among different European Parliament committees, a dozen uh, directory generals and commissioners dealing with different aspects um, of the single market. Politically, uh, this may be beneficial because it is far more recognizable for particular stakeholders, groups, citizens, and uh, the media. Almost exactly a year ago, Professor Mario Monti highlighted the problematic effect of fragmentation in his uh, report. These negative effects uh, are, for example, um, that uh, the market fragmentation concentrates excessive market power, prevents economic of scale, and slow down investment in infrastructure and services. In other words, market fragmentation means reducing our potential for economic growth and job creation. Fiscal stability is fundamental, but fiscal stability itself doesn't improve the productivity and doesn't increase jobs. Only a deeper, wider, and updated single market help us to create more jobs in Europe and to lead Europe to sustainable recovery. Therefore, the problem, as I see, is not the chopping up of the internal market, the problem market policy. Uh, the problem lies rather in the lack of an overarching platform for different aspects of the single market. And the main purpose and the very essence of the Single Market Act is to provide this overarching platform. Everything has, however, its cost. It is not a coincidence when it comes to talking about uh, the single market. We find ourselves using numerous strange catchwords such as missing link, bottlenecks, malfunctioning. The single market is incomplete. Its potential are not fully exploited and, and many uh, others. I think highlighting weak points seems to be crucially important and necessary, although they do not provide a solid uh, basis for relaunching the single market, and they certainly do not stimulate and inspire stakeholders. The troubleshooter approach, as I call it, is negative and disheartening, and that is why we need the overarching framework of the Single Market Act to draw together and to move forward. The importance of the single market is underlined not only in terms of potential uh, to increase productivity, but also in terms of its role in giving incentives to innovation. Market integration has a lot of positive impacts on incentives to innovate. To innovate. Size of the market increasingly matters, and the relationship are here straightforward. The bigger the market is, the stronger the incentives are to invest in innovation, because the investment is more cost-effective. And on the other hand, bigger markets means fiercer competition, and that is also recognized as an incentive to innovate. So in this regard, strengthening incentives for innovation via deepening, widening, and updating the single market is of vital importance on the European agenda. Hence, I am glad to tell you that in March, the Competitiveness Council under the Hungarian presidency gave the green light for the creation of the keenly and long-awaited unitary patent system. Uh, the EU-wide patent would not only be cheaper and simple, but it would abolish the present fragmented market on which investors have to deal with 27 different legal systems, and hence it would induce further investments into R&D. Avoiding market fragmentation, addressing the troubleshooting approach and boosting innovation via deeper, wider and updated single market is critical to pave Europe's way to recovery, although we should be aware of the plain truth that the single market is a never-ending story. It is a permanent production. I think it is a journey, not a destination. It will never be finished, in fact, quite a reverse. As technology is developing at an unprecedented speed and it is shaping our lives in unprecedented ways, the single market is constantly being updated. Similarly, there has always been a time lag between the economic and the technological changes on the one hand and the national and EU level uh, regulation on the other. 
So in March this year, the Competitiveness Council under the Hungarian presidency discussed in detail the outcomes of the four months long public debate held on the single market and the criteria to be used for selecting the areas for priority commitment. Following this debate, the Council intends to adopt conclusions focusing on 12 priority actions during its meetings at the end of May. We are bringing to an end a period of reviewing and assessment within the single market and are now entering a new phase of actions focused on the 12 priorities. So without going uh, into details of all 12 issues separately, I would like to point three themes and priorities that we consider the most important. First, SME support in form of improvement access to finance, improved availability uh, of venture funds and reduced red tape. Second, digital markets, including e-commerce, e-identification, e-authentication and e-signature, everything with e and innovation, including introducing the unitary patent and standardization system. So I want to end this discussion of the single market by revisiting Hayek again. The competitiveness of Europe and the competition within Europe. The success of the single market is dependent on how these maxims are fostered and balanced. Europe's historical competitive advantage has been its decentralized structure that enables experimentation with different development models. The single market is rooted in the very diversity within Europe, as much, on, as, much as on the common frameworks that we have uh, built. So I would like to now touch uh, on the Hungarian situation to give a sense how far we have come during the past year. As the new Hungarian government took office in June last year, we were confronted with uh, the fact that the previous government were riding uh, the way of the, as I mentioned before, this irrational exuberance, resulting in a high budget deficit and mounting public debt. When we left office in 2002, the public debt was at the <clears throat> 54% of the GDP clearly below the master criterion to introduce the euro. But only eight years later, uh, when we returned to power in June, in, in June uh, 2010, we were faced with the doting fact uh, that the public debt had risen to 80% of GDP. Moreover, we inherited a black hole in the last year's budget in the amount of, uh, we calculated, 1.8 billion euros. The budget deficit of 3.8% of GDP was targeted by the previous government. It had only forgotten to create the relevant expenditures and re revenues to achieve this target. Anecdotally, almost every new government around uh, that time found a scrap of paper in the Treasury with the words written on it, no money left. Uh, we had faced, uh, however, the much more serious situation, huge debt left. So in order to tackle the fiscal imbalances we inherited from the previous government, we cut expenditure and embarked on some unusual, or as some observer call it, unorthodox, I would rather use the term non-mainstream, economic policy measures. Among them, the new government introduced the so-called crisis taxes that are levied on economic sectors such as banks, energy, telecom and retail. Undoubtedly, these crisis taxes were not in line with the mainstream, but unusual times call for unusual measures. Today, we can see these non-mainstream measures have paid off. Hungary is able to finance its debt, his, its debt on the bond market to a relatively appropriate yield on bonds, and the credit default swaps has been continuously decreasing since the end of last year. And this year and in the coming years, Hungary is able to manage its budget deficit clearly below the 3% mark. Moreover, using these unusual measures, we are not only able to consolidate the budget to 2012, to the end of 2012, but we gained precious time that was badly needed to carry out deep reform to make the budget sustainable in the long run. That means after uh, uh, 2012, without deep uh, depending on one of measures such as uh, crisis taxes. That means we abolish these uh, taxes uh, uh, from uh, 1st of January 2013. These reforms, which are laid down in the already mentioned sale common plan, are addressing two main issues. One target is to create a smaller, 
but more effective state that is able to pro uh, provide public serv uh, services by using taxpayers' money in much more uh, efficient way. The second main target is to restructure the labor market in order to give more incentives for people to enter the labor market instead of relying on state benefits. The introduction of the 16% flat tax on every personal income uh, in this year was the first step to invite people to regular jobs. Now, the revising of the early retirement and unemployment benefit schemes are the second steps to incentivize people to enter the labor <coughs> market. In the meantime, we launched clear pre-business, pro-business agenda by reducing corporate tax, as I mentioned, from 19% to 10% for small and medium-sized businesses, by abolishing some small taxes, and by introduction a large-scale program for cutting red tape uh, that will take away the administrative burden on businesses in Hungary in a value of 1.5 billion euro. Our stated aim is to create 1 million new jobs in Hungary by the end of this decade and to create the most competitive business environment in Eastern and Central Europe. So let me conclude just in a few words. So what is for the sleeping giant? Is Europe now waking up to find itself tied up and trapped, unable to move, only able to gaze up at the sky as Gulliver Fund himself? Or is Europe waking the strength and self-confidence in its position and potential as a leading economic power internationally? Listening to the Austrian economist, above all, Joseph Schumpeter, the answer to the recent crisis is straightforward. Markets recover by themselves through the famous scale of creative destruction. It is, however, easier to say than to follow in responsible policy making. Hence, we should not wait for the markets to recover on their own. We should rather rely on policies that can pave the way for the recovery, growth, and job creation. And I think the single market is one of the best ways to achieve this goal. Thank you very much.